Welcome back to One on One. Andrew Posada is here alongside Nick DeLuca, and I am pleased to welcome our next guest, national baseball writer, but more importantly, Yankees writer and reporter for ESPN, <laughs> Marley Rivera. Marley, it's a pleasure to have you here on One on One. Oh, I'm so glad to be on with you guys. I'm sorry that it took me so long to come on. Uh, sometimes our schedules can be a little tricky, but um, I really wanted to, uh, to be on with you guys. So thank you, Andrew, and, and thanks, Nick, for having me. It's a pleasure. And let's, I, I want to get your perspective right away because me and Nick, we have not been out in the field yet for WFUV. Uh, but as one I'm of the, glad. <laughs> but as one of the first reporters to start covering baseball games once yeah. baseball resumed, how has your experience been this season covering games and going on a daily basis covering the Yankees as opposed to previous seasons? Well, I think that um, we've been trying to find an adjective, right? In the beginning, we said we used the noun chaos. And now I think that the, the latest adjective that I've been able to find is sad. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it isn't, I can't find it. I'm supposed to be, you know, a senior baseball writer. I really can't find a better word for it than sadness when you are there. One of the things that happens and one of the reasons right now I'm, I'm currently speaking to you guys from Buffalo where the Yankees are playing at, at Solon Field. And one of the reasons why we've actually been enjoying, ironically, coming to a minor league ballpark is because it gives you the little bit of feel of being closer to the action. One of the things that is happening, for example, when you go to press boxes, just to mention a few, like PNC Park in Pittsburgh or like in Washington, D.C. at the Nationals Park, they're really far removed. It's almost like a fourth decker, right, where you're watching the field and it looks like you're watching it on TV. It's just a very difficult thing. I never thought, I mean, I was one of those writers, you know, one of those old, you know, old woman yells at cloud who would get very annoyed at the fans and who hated Sweet Caroline and who hates like, you know, Blue Jays, Blue Jays, let's play ball. And I am always saying all that crap that they do in game. I wish I was listening to it now. I mean, this is just... It is, it is a very, very difficult environment to work with, and, th and it's a sad environment to work with. And the reason why all of us got in sport is because this is what we love to do and brings us a lot of joy, right? And, and it, there's a lot of hard work that goes into it, but there's a lot of joy tied to it, and that's the part that's missing. There's not a lot of joy in everything that we do because even when we have to do these Zoom calls, right, I could be with you guys, you know, at Yankee Stadium doing this, right, right on the field instead of having to do Zoom. So every time I do this, and every time you're there, you really are reminded that you're in a pandemic. But at the same time, you feel very lucky that you're still employed because a lot of my colleagues have lost their jobs. So a really weird season for you and a really weird season for the Yankees. A really good start. And then you have the 5-15 and 15 rough patch. They now win 10 in a row and now have lost two straight. How differently does this team feel right now, at least now that they're getting healthy? I think that they've always known, and it's kind of interesting about the Yankees. One of the things that we commented in the, and I'll say the stupid name, summer camp, I hated that term, uh, spring training 2.0, was that the Yankees always stayed on message. Every time you asked them about the trouble with coronavirus or the positive testing or whatever it was about the 107 page protocols or anything like that, they never complained. There wasn't a single moment where a single Yankee would say, oh, I have to wear my mask. Or I have, you know, the first time we've heard the Yankees openly complain has been about the bubble. That's the one thing that they really have been very open about complaining. So since the beginning, this has been a team that there's been a certainty about them. There's just no, it's almost like they knew that their destiny was to be in the playoffs. And once we knew that it was going to be a 16 game, you know, 16 team, pardon me, expanded playoff, we kind of knew that they were going to make it. But what's happening is that they're an up and down team that has been extremely inconsistent. And one of the things that has that, that it's getting lost in all these conversations is that we are in a pandemic, people. You're supposed to be inconsistent. You're supposed to handle these things. You know, sometimes you handle them well and sometimes you don't. But when you look at, you know, the things that other teams have had to deal with and the amount of injuries, right, at one point, the race lost nine of their pitchers. I mean, that's incredible uh, to the IL. Then you see other teams handling it a little bit better. And I think the Yankees are really confident you know, that's had, but it, that's never wavered. It has been a thing that has happened all season. But of course, if you have, you know, a healthy Aaron Judge, a her, quote unquote healthy Giancarlo Stanton, and you have a healthy Gio Urshela and a healthy Glaber Torres, or so they claim, because sometimes uh, we look at them on the field and you kind of wonder, then you certainly feel good about your chances out there. Yeah, and Marley, you talk about those injuries, and that's really led 
to the inconsistency throughout this season. But mm, now, that but I, d- I disagree with you because last year the Yankees had much, much, many, many, many injuries, and they actually set the record by putting 30 players in 39 different stints in the IL. So no, you can't blame the injuries. I'm not no, taking I, that. I would say it's a small <laughs> portion. It's not the majority of the pie, but in a 60 yeah, exactly. game season, yeah. I think the injuries are more effective because every win I is disagree. worth three times more. I disagree more. with you. I disagree with you. It isn't about the injuries. You cannot use that as an excuse because if we sit down and say this and we look at the numbers for the teams that have had injuries, the numbers are better than the Yankees and they've had a lot more injuries. So the injuries have happened to everybody. There isn't, you know, look at Tampa, Tampa Bay is the perfect example. They lost, I just said it, nine pitchers and two of their offensive stars. The Yankees lost four of their offensive stars. They didn't lose nine pitchers, right? Let's be very clear. Yeah. So then in Tampa Bay, it's about to close in into the ALE's title. So the, the injuries can't be the excuse. There has to be something else about consistency that is not happening with this team. And that is what the Yankees need to figure out uh, before they get to the playoffs. Well, I bring up the injuries only to say, only to say that now that guys are coming back and this team is getting healthier, this team has to be without a doubt a favorite now with guys coming back. If they're near 100%, th- this is a team that has championship aspirations. It has to still be championship or bust, correct? Well, it has to be. That certainly is their attitude. I actually was talking to Aaron Judge about this yesterday. I said, Aaron, last year, one of the last questions that I asked Aaron Judge last year, which became a pretty popular kind of viral question, was the fact that I said, is this season a failure? And he said, yes, we did not win the World Series, so this season is a failure. And I asked Aaron about that yesterday. I said, Aaron, is this season a failure? And he said, yes, again. So, absolutely the only aspiration that the Yankees can have and the only aspiration that they should have is in a 60 game season winning the World Series right it has to be but they haven't proven at this point you know of course on paper anyone's a favorite we've seen that many 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 times but on the field it's an entirely different story so if on paper you're asking me just by numbers and by who those players are and by pedigree Absolutely. The Yankees should be at the top of that, you know, you know, power hitting board and everything like that. And they dominate every number and everything, but they haven't proven they can be consistent. They haven't proven that they can pitch consistently. So I don't know that the favorite logo is is still on them. Marley, you touched on the Rays who are closing in on winning the AL East for the Yankees. That means you're looking at the four or the five seed right now. And it seems pretty likely that they'll be matching up in the wild card round with the Minnesota Twins. They're one back in the loss column of the four seed in the American League with six games left. How important do you think playing that wild card round is if it's at home as opposed to being on the road at Target Field? All you need to do is look at the numbers of Luke Luke Voigt's home run on the road and at home. That's it. That just gives you your answer. I mean, as, as Brian Cashman and Aaron Boone have both said, the Yankees team and the Yankees lineup is a lineup designed for Yankee Stadium which means that completely your advantage is to play at home. We know what they can do with that porch. We know what they can do, right, you know, to opposite field. You have the comforts of home. So the Yankees really want that fourth seed. It's a very, very important thing for them. And not only that, they are really happy that they're playing the Minnesota Twins. I mean, at this point, we know historically what they've done. We saw what happened last year. It was one of the biggest disappointments, probably that series for me. I mean, I'm not saying, obviously, I'm not a Yankee fan. I'm no one's fan, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a sports writer, and I see things down the middle. But one of the things that was really disappointed last season was to see how terrible that series was, right? Because the Minnesota Twins were wonderful, right? One of the, you know, they, they beat the Yankees, you know, with the most amount of home runs in, the, in Major League Baseball history, and then they folded. And I'm sure the Yankees are really, really happy to see them, you know, the Twins pretty much penciled in uh, to play them, play them in the playoffs. But absolutely, their home numbers are incredible in comparison to on the road. They don't want to go to Minnesota. They don't want to travel. They want to keep up that bubble in New York City, and they want to match some home runs at home and just move on to the next round. Yeah, and one of those names you mentioned, Luke Voigt, he leads Major League Baseball with 21 <laughs> home runs. As someone who has been around the team, what have you seen in Luke's maturity and his progression in the last season compared to this, well, this season compared to last? Well, Andrew, you, you've given me like an opening to plug my stuff, and I, and I never do that, but I'm going to. because. Go you have a, we're coming out with a big feature on ESPN on Luke Boyd tomorrow that I've written. And one of the things that, it's, um, that, that I've learned about Luke Voigt is that almost having 1,700 at-bats in the minors before being called up is the best thing that could have happened to him. This is a guy who got humbled. 
right? He was a guy who was a Missouri State, you know, superstar, gets picked by his hometown team. I mean, he gets a letter from David Freeze the first game he's going to play, you know, as a Cardinal, and then he fails. And the greatest thing that could have happened to Luke Voigt is failure, right? And we say that very often. We hear, oh, you learn from your failures. Luke Voigt is the poster child of learning from your failures. And that is number one, what he's learned to do. One of the things that Voigt has been doing is that he's being himself. When he came up to the majors, he had that famous line of he was going to hit doubles and bombs, right? This is all I'm going to do for the Cardinals. I'm going to hit doubles and bombs. Mm, didn't really quite happen until the Yankees gave him a chance. And that opportunity of being there every day, Luke Voigt grabbed it and held on to it for dear life. And that's exactly what Luke Voigt has done. He's taking that opportunity. He's taking it a step forward, which is something that we have not seen, you know, with someone like, just to mention, you know, somebody, Mike Ford or Mike Talkman, right, that they could not keep up that incredible performance that they had for the Yankees in the whole next man up, you know, deal that we saw last year. Luke Voigt has proven that he's the right, you know, the, the real deal. Now, some people say, well, you know, he's going into his first year, you know, of negotiating, you know, some, some extra money and so on. You know what? He's done this in a 60-game season in the middle of coronavirus. And at this point right now, Luke Voigt has more RBIs than Giancarlo Stanton, Aaron Judge, and Glaber Torres combined. So he certainly has been, at this point, a superstar. And like Aaron, Aaron Boone called him, the MVP of the team. And it came with learning from your mistakes. It came from coming up, you know, at 29, you know, whatever, 28 years old, to be a regular player in the majors when you're closer to 30. When you thought that you would never have a chance, this is not Juan Soto, right? This is not a kid who turned 21 in the World Series and won it. This is a guy who was a grinder, who was called a bench warmer. Right. And now you see what he's doing. And he is, I mean, it's incredible. The example that he is of persevering and really uh, living your dreams. You talked about Voigt being the MVP of the Yankees. Well, how about the MVP of the American League? How do you think his <laughs> chances stand for being named the AL MVP? Well, let's just say he's very lucky that Mookie Betts is playing for the Dodgers. And <laughs> He's no longer uh, in Boston. Absolutely. He's going to be in that conversation, right? And it's really, as we all know, um, it, maybe your fans don't know and the people who listen to you, the only numbers that matter for those are regular season numbers. So you can be, you know, you can be incredible in the playoffs, but that's not going to matter. So I do think that certainly Void has placed himself in that conversation, but there's a lot, there's a lot of guys that are going to have a little bit of a, of a say in that, particularly coming from the West Coast, you know, and the athletics and the Tampa Bay Rays. Uh, some especially... You know, I know that they always say you never have relievers and pitchers as MVPs uh, because they're not everyday players. But there's a lot of players out there that have made their teams what they are today, especially when you look at the Chicago White Sox, you know, as a prime example, that are going to give Voight a run for his money. But um, he certainly is going to get some votes. I don't have an MVP vote this year, but if I did, I would vote for him. And Marley, you touched on the expanded playoffs and having each te eight teams from each league come in. Moving yes. forward, when we get back into a 162-game regular season, what are the realistic chances of keeping this playoff format? And if they don't keep this format, do you have any suggestions? What do you think is the best way moving forward for the postseason? I'm going to come out as old lady yells at cloud, and I don't <laughs> care. But this is what's going to happen with the expanded playoffs is the exact same thing that's going to happen with the Universal DH, which is it's going to become a fixture. That's exactly what's going to happen. Just get over it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's all about money. It's okay. Baseball is a business. They lost billions this year, and they need to make up some of that money, and it gives more jobs to people. So I'm all for it. I'm all for more players being employed and more people getting paid. But it does, for me, it really does take away, first of all, the wonder of the wild card, which is one of the greatest, right? The wild card era has been so fun for us since 1993, and now – it takes that all away. But it doesn't mean that it cannot become its own exciting thing, right? It can actually become, I think with a few tweaks, maybe the expanded playoffs would be better. I do think that the higher seeds deserve a better advantage than just, just home field advantage. You know, I, I just don't know what you could do, but with a few tweaks, it could work. You know, the Universal DH is going to happen, much to my dismay, and I'm a very, very, very small minority who hates it. <laughs> and, um, but I think it's just here to stay. So I don't know that, uh, that anything is going to change. We're probably going to keep it. 
you mentioned the things that, that, are, that are going to stay. One of the things that hopefully will not stay is a postseason <laughs> bubble. Uh, the Yankees, I don't want to skip a step, but if they are to make it to the ALDS, that would be in San Diego. It's not 360 to write anymore, but that isn't 314 either. You mentioned the advantage of playing at home. How difficult a task do you think that will be for the Yankees having to play the playoffs not in Yankee Stadium? I think it's going to even out. Right, this is going to be even for everyone. We talk about that all the time, right? When we have a neutral seed and we have, I'm sorry, a neutral place where you're playing a game. That's, that's the best part, quote unquote, right? Like that you're gonna get to do that. You're gonna get to see that, who the teams really are without the advantages of how they're built for their home ballparks. So I don't think that it's going to be, you know, partic- it, it might affect the Yankees, you know, a little bit, like you said, you know, the, the, the lines are obvious, right? The distances are obvious. But I think the Yankees, you know, they've always played very well on the road. They've always played very well in San Diego. I'm sure they would love the idea of playing in San Diego at Petco Park instead of Dodger Stadium. That's an issue. I mean, playing at Dodger Stadium has, it comes with a lot of issues, especially in terms of space and so on, because it's a very, very small ballpark. But those kinds of things, you know, a very old one too. So I think that the Yankees will thrive in San Diego. I mean that. I think it's the best position for them. But the bubble, that's a different story. We, uh, we just heard it yesterday. Again, Aaron Judge uh, bitching about it. That's all I can say. They all have the same thing with Gardy. They're all saying, like, we hate it, we hate it, we hate it. But you know what? Uh, you know, like I always say, just pinch your nose and swallow hard and, and take it. Because there's a lot of real issues in the world. So right now, being stuck in a five-star hotel where you play in the playoffs and you get everything catered to you, um, it's not the, the worst place to be. So just get over it. And not only that, uh, the NBA has been doing this whole bubble thing for quite some time. You get to do it for just a couple of weeks. So I think this is the time where we have to remember that this is a pandemic and we should shut up and feel very lucky that we get to play Major League Baseball and play in the playoffs. And Marley, before we get you out of here, I want you to finish this statement that I have for you. The New York Yankees will win the 2020 World Series if? If the Dodgers have a severe injury. That's it. That's it. It's all predicated on the Dodgers. Yeah. I think that the, I don't know that, the, and I haven't decided. I actually haven't really looked at it. You know, once I see the playoff picture, it'll be easier, right? My pick in the beginning of the season uh, was the Dodgers, but this is an entire different season, right? So let's not, let's not go there. I don't see anyone getting past the Dodgers if the Dodgers are healthy. It doesn't mean that it's the New York Yankees or anybody else because the Dodgers are a team on a mission and they have all that experience of having been and lost two World Series at home. And uh, one of the things that happened with the Kansas City Royals that I had a conversation with them after they lose in 2014 to the San Francisco Giants was how much it irked them and hurt them to see another team celebrate at home. And I think that really, really matters for the Dodgers. I think there's a, there's a huge chip on their shoulder that they're going to show up there. We know what's happened. We know the conversation. We know 1985 as a date and so on. And I just don't see it. And I don't think that the Yankees, as of right now, have proven that they can you know, beat teams with great pitching, like the Rays and the Oakland Athletics and so on. So until they can prove that, but I don't think that anyone uh, gets past the healthy Dodgers. National baseball writer, senior <laughs> baseball writer, you can catch her covering. That just means covering... I'm old. That's all it means is that I'm old. That's it. <laughs> you can That's catch awesome. her covering and reporting for the New York Yankees on ESPN. Marley Rivera. Marley, we really appreciate the time here on One on One. And I appreciate uh, being on with you guys and, you know, my love. And hopefully the next time we do this is in a ballpark and we don't have to do uh, this crappy Zoom thing anymore. God, talk about a word that I hate and I will hate forever. Zoom. Thank you so very much, <laughs> Thanks, Marley. Marley. Thanks for your time. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me. All right.